Welcome to the Better Than Rich Show with your hosts, Andrew Biggs and Mike Abramowitz. The Better Than Rich Show helps ambitious leaders who are on a mission to leave the world better than they found it, change their perspective on what's important, increase their income and impact, and systemize their life and business. If you've ever struggled with finding your purpose, have felt disconnected or distracted, or found yourself going through the motions, this show will remind you that what you do matters and will re-inspire you to chase your highest dreams. It's time for you to become better than rich. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Better Than Rich Show. I'm your host, Andrew Biggs, and I'm here with my co-host, Mike Abramowitz. Mike, how are you doing today? Always a great day. How are you, Andrew? I'm doing great, man. Doing well. We got like four inches of snow overnight, so it, you know we don't get snow very often in Arkansas. But when we do, everything shuts down. People go crazy. Uh, so yeah, we got this 70 degree weather here, man. It was awful. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm heading to Miami next week, so it should get a little bit of sunshine. It should be fun. Well, hey, man, I'm excited about today's topic. Uh, I definitely think it's uh, something that people tell us we're good at, right? And you know, generally, I don't like to pat myself on the back, but if an Enough people say that we're good at something. Uh, I'll, I'll at least take that uh, as a compliment and uh, you know give myself some authority on it. By the way, I see a few people live. If you are here with us live um, on the, the, the Facebook page, uh, you can go ahead and send your comments in, and we can actually you know interact with you live during the show, and that will also make the recording as well. So if you're here with us live, feel free to jump in and mention that if you have any questions or comments. Uh, but here's today's converse, uh, today's topic of conversation is uh, how to have transformative. Con- conversations. And, uh, you know, a lot of people that I work with, uh, and I assume you can relate to this, want to know how do you actually get someone over the edge? How do you have someone change and change for good? And maybe you're sitting there even listening, asking yourself, well, I've tried to put new things in place or build new habits. Uh, it's the start of the year. Maybe you have some New Year's resolutions this year and you're asking yourself, well, how do I move past the point of no return and actually make a transformative change in my life? So that's the topic of today. Uh, so Mike, I would love to kick it to you to kick us off and uh yeah when you when you think about this question of how to have transformative conversations where do you like to begin i like to begin with the end in mind so it's like what is the desired outcome that i'd like to help this person either get to or feel at the end of the conversation so i do this quite often where uh anytime i look at my calendar for the day i i i will take a moment and just look at each name of the person that I have on my calendar and just think about what does this person need in, you know, from my lens, but also like try to empathize with their lens. Like, what are they going through? Well, what, what, do, what do I feel like? What do I feel like they are at right now in, in life? What do I think they need? What do I think I, I want them to feel? And I'll just sort of think with the end in mind before I show up to the conversation. And then once I get to the conversation, I'm always going to show up with curiosity curiosity and empathy uh curious where are you at empathize with whatever it is they're feeling so uh, i mean that that's my initial first reaction of like if i'm going to go into a conversation i want to make sure that i'm present to have a transformational conversation what is my end outcome what are my desired outcomes of the combo how do i want them to feel and also can i make sure that i'm aligned with them curious empathetic uh so so i can be as present as possible Awesome. Yeah. And I was going to ask a follow up where it's like you're setting intentions, but how do you also balance that with what we don't know, right? Um, You know, to use the Johari's window analogy, if you don't know what Johari's window is, you can look this up, but uh, everyone has a blind spot, everyone has a mask. Uh, How how do you make sure that um, you actually get them to give you more information instead of just making assumptions? Because one of the things I recognize is uh, I, I like to set intentions, but if I set too many intentions, maybe I'll try to force my perspective onto the situation, and maybe my perspective is actually wrong because I don't have a complete picture. What are your What are your thoughts there? I 100% valid. And that's why it's the balance between the empathy and curiosity. It's like, I have ideas of what I think based on the evidence that's in front of me, but I'm also willing to pivot 
as needed as the conversation unfolds. So there's that flexibility that needs to be there. Uh, so yes, there there is some level of intentionality that goes in before the combo, and all of that goes out the window. It's almost like a, like a sport. You know, we have plays that we're calling, mm-hmm. but sometimes you get to the line and you got to call an audible, right? Like the play can only go so far. It's a good strategy until it's not. Sure, sure. You know, uh, one of my mentors uh, used to say, "Plan tight and hang loose." Uh, and, and so the, the whole idea there is, yes, have a plan coming in uh, for uh, a transformative conversation to take place. Uh, I do want to get into some nuts and bolts of how to actually have that conversation. But as a starting point, it's like set intentions and then also be willing to throw, you know, any part of your plan out the window, depending on how that person shows up. Um, and how do you know, right? Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we know when to pivot. Um, and yeah, I was talking with someone last night, uh, a friend of ours, and he has a, an MBA. And he says, yeah, the, you know, probably the only thing I remember from business school uh, was the answer to every business question. And the answer to every best business question is, it depends. And uh, I think this whole balance between set intentions and half curiosity is a great example of that. It's like, how do you know when to kind of push your agenda? And how do you know when to, um, you know, allow their new information to actually color the conversation and take it in a different direction? And the answer really is it depends, but how do you know when? Um, And that's why, you know, showing up with presence, right, is so important. Um, When we show up with complete presence and we're able to really meet the moment for that person, they can sense that, they can feel that. They can also sense and feel when you're distracted, when you're sending emails at the same time you're on the call, when you're actually thinking about the conversation you had with your boss, you know, 30 minutes ago. Um, when we are distracted, uh, whether it's with home life, personal life, business life, uh, anything that's on our minds, besides that person sitting in front of us on the Zoom call, or that person on the other end of the line, or that person sitting in our office or out to lunch or breakfast uh, or coffee, when we're anywhere else, the, the likelihood of a transformative conversation goes down dramatically. Nobody's interested in opening up and sharing something that maybe they're uncomfortable sharing, which is sort of a prerequisite for transformation for transformation if the person isn't present. So, you know, making sure that you set these intentions, that you show up the right way energetically, physiologically, um, that you actually have the awareness to pick up on subtle cues, um, you know, uh, so that you know when to pivot. You can assess the line and the and the the coverage package that you know the, the opposing team is showing up with and call the right play the right audible in real time like what do you what do you think about that yeah it's 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 a great reflection of of like what you said you you want to make sure that you in order to stay present you got to kind of like step step away from what you were doing when you're stepping into the next activity that you're stepping into so it's like how do you do that well First, the, 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 there's the drop down menu for me is like, I, I gotta breathe. When I'm Zoom hopping, I don't know if, you, if you're guilty of Zoom hopping, when I'm Zoom sure. hopping conversation to conversation, it's like, I, I, I do I, I do a box breath that's been very helpful, uh, which is uh, in for six, hold for six, out for six, breathe, you know, relax for six, in for six, out. You know, this like six second box breath, usually one or two rounds of that, just gonna get recentered before I go into my next conversation. So that way I'm not bringing the past into the, into the present. Uh, I think it's really important. I also think uh, to the question that you said, it's like, how do you know, how do you know what, um, you know, is this what this person might need or how do you know what this person is feeling or how do you know if they're like being full, fully closed? You know, f- like how do, how do, how do we know? How does, how does the coach or the person of influence know if this other person showing up to the call. I don't care if it's their parents. I don't care if it's their significant other. I'm curious to hear from you on that. Like, mm-hmm. how do you know intuitively that this person is withholding something or they're not playing full out or if they're not, you know, if all the cards aren't on the table, you know, using all these like little metaphors here. Well, one of the, you know, more interesting things that, you know, um, from a psychoanalyst perspective, I think it was Carl Rogers, um, who's a famous, um, you know, psychologist from back in the day, kind of from the lineage of Freud and then Jung. Uh, Carl Rogers is very uh, influential in that perspective. And he had, a, he had a kind of a maxim, a concept that he said, if the conversation isn't interesting, then there's nothing therapeutic taking place. <laughs> and, uh, you know, 
I, I think that that's insanely true. Uh, when I am very interested in the conversation and they are very interested in the conversation, it, it's at least creating the potential field for us to uh, create a transformation. Uh, so then how do you know if something's interesting? Well, use your own barometer. Is this an interesting conversation or not? Uh, that's a one like really intuitive way to do it. Um, but you know some other ways that are are you know really um, interesting as well would be you know to pay attention to subtle cues right and what sort of subtle cues could you pay attention to you could pay attention to their body language uh, how are they holding themselves how are they carrying themselves uh, you can pay attention to their level of eye contact uh, you can definitely pay attention to. Um, uh, I would say they're language patterns, right? So um, paying attention to subtle ways that they phrase something in their in their language patterns will give you clues and hints about where this person's at. You know, I was talking with somebody about a relationship that they're in and there's just little clues and you can kind of pick up on them like, do you really trust this person 100% or, or not? And they're like, yeah, I don't. How did you know? And the only way you can tell is by looking for these subtle clues and hints. Uh, when we think about, you know, things being reflected Reflective uh, in nature, we're, we're thinking about like you know light reflecting off of something, and so then we know it's true. Well, the same thing is true with our how we carry ourselves. Um, we are some, you know some things people can conceal and hide, but other things they can't. And body language, you know, their eye contact, uh, subtle cues about how their language comes out, um, they can't do so much. Does anything come, for you, come up for you on that, Mike? In terms of subtle cues to pay attention to to know uh, if we're on the right track or not. There was three that showed up for me that I just jotted down that that are cues for me that I, that help me read between the lines. So uh, the three read between the lines for me is if I hear someone say the word need, if I hear someone consistently using the word they or like other people, or if they're using the words like not sure. So anytime I hear them say the word need, that shows like, okay, there's potential for scarcity. So it's like, oh, I just need to make phone calls. Or I just need to, you know, get my money in order. I just need to hit the gym a little bit more. So that means they're coming from a place of scarcity. So I'm going to kind of feel into that a little bit and just see if that's the truth. Sometimes the language gives us clues. So you have the clues from the language. You have the clues from their their physiology. So you just kind of use some of those clues and it's like, cool, then I can feel into that with like, oh, tell me a little bit more about need. What's your relationship with need versus want? You know, it might be a question to explore. If they say they, like something like, oh, my mom keeps talking to me about this or my manager talks about this or, you know, they, they constantly are talking about this in the media and that's just, uh, they're just like, they're just this or they're just that. So it's almost like this blame. So that means they're not taking some sort of responsibility for something. So that's a cue of like, they don't want to take ownership. So there's some sort of barrier or ego or something that I want to kind of bring down that wall and at least open up the conversation uh, around that. So that's a cue for me. And the other one is uh, like, I'm not sure. I'm just not sure if I really want that. I'm not sure. Like, is this the right time? Or, you know, I just have a lot going on right now. So I'm just really uncertain or not sure. So it's like, if they have this, um, this rela- you know, what's the relationship with uncertainty? And that might be something that I might want to explore with them. So that way it doesn't become debilitating, but we can also explore like finding certainty within certainty, or maybe it could be a self-confidence thing. So these are, these are three really good cues that anybody can use just to kind of, kind of bring down the barrier to entry and, and just start asking questions around that. So it's like, Hey, tell me a little bit more about your relationship with uncertainty, insecurity, mm-hmm. you know, blame, you know, confidence or something like that. And just see what type of floodgates open up. Awesome. Awesome. And, you know, so one of the things that I, I mentioned earlier is I want to share a little bit of like nuts and bolts, right? There's kind of like the art of si- uh, the art of transformation and there's the science. Um, a lot of what we're discussing so far are like, you know, it's always like prerequisites or you know, a little bit more like the art. Uh, I was like, you know, okay, when do I want to like, you know, use my paintbrush and, and, and use this sort of stroke or when do I want to use this sort of tool versus that sort of tool? Um, one of the one of the things that I think is also really useful though is to give people tools that are like a little bit more scientific and in my opinion there's a little bit of an art to this conversation uh, so I'll share kind of a few things um, with this conversation uh, we'll have 
much more time to go in depth um, at our event. It's going to be a, a topic for Sunday's converse, conversation at the VIP experience uh, on March 20th uh, when, we, when we meet in Tampa live. But here's like a, an overview of this conversation to kind of give you guys some idea, like a skeleton uh, of what this conversation could look like. So, you know, generally speaking, right off the bat, we want to build rapport um, really quickly, though. Uh, and it's not just build rapport, like how have you been, how's the weather or whatever. Um, it's a lot of like syncing up energetically. I want to ask myself, you know, what kind of mood is this person in? What's what's their energy level? Um, you know, are they are they focused? Are they distracted? And the best way to do that is just kind of ask an open ended question that gets them talking for sixty to ninety seconds, right? So it could just be, you know, um, hey, I, you know, I know we haven't you know talked in a while, um, but how, how you know how things been with the family? By the way, we haven't chatted on that in a while, and just let them rant for sixty seconds. It gives me a time time to actually understand. Like it's almost a transition into um, the conversation. If it's a sales conversation, I really like to ask something simple like, "Hey, uh, you know, hey, I don't know too much about you. Whereabouts in the country are you located?" And they just kind of talk about where they're where they're from. Uh, and because a lot of sales actually is a transformative conversation when you think about it, we're trying to take somebody with from not actually having a solution to a problem to investing in a solution in a problem, no matter what the products or service you're providing is. So that that opening section is really simple. But then the next thing is called a preframe, right? And a preframe is maybe, you know, again, probably 30 to 90 seconds. But basically what I'm doing is I'm laying out what our goals are, what are objectives for the conversation, how we're going to get there, uh, building a little credibility along the way, and then I'm going to tell them what we're going to do at the end, right? Next steps. So it might look something like this. Hey, um, Mike, thanks for joining uh, this conversation. I'm super excited to chat with you. Really, my goal, my objective here today is really just to understand more about who you are, what you're all about, um, understand what's working, what's not in your life, uh, where your pain points are, and what's stopping you from getting what you really desire in life. And uh, in order to do that, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. So the more open and honest you can be, the better. And uh, I'll also offer you some perspective based on you know the, the thousands of conversations I've had uh, with people in similar positions. Uh, I think you'll get a ton of value from this call either way. Uh, by the end of the call, we should have a pretty good sense of whether or not it's a potential fit. If not, no worries. I'll try to point you in the right direction. If there is a potential fit, I can tell you a little bit about how I work with my clients. And we can decide to work together or not work together in either way is fine. Does that sound good to you? And basically what we've done there is we laid out That's the goals. <laughs> there you go. We've laid out the goals and the objectives, right? We've talked about how we're going to get there. Um, built a little credibility, had thousands of conversations like this, or, you know, hey, I'm a coach of six and seven figure earners, so I'm sure you're going to get value from this conversation. And then next steps, and then you get their agreement. Once they agree to the premise, right, does that sound good, which is a, one of the easiest yes questions in the world. Once they agree with the premise, now... Right. Anytime they try to stray from the, the the agreement that we just made, they cannot. Right. It doesn't make sense because they're incongruent with the word they just said. So that's creating a frame around the conversation. Now that is a sales preframe, but you can equally come up with one just to sit down and have a transformative conversation with a subordinate who's underperforming or with somebody who's really struggling with an addiction problem. There's so many different ways to use this. There's more nuts and bolts I want to get into, but I want to. Continue to you, Mike. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I'm glad you just mentioned that you could use this for outside of just a sales conversation. So mm -hmm. if you're if you're running a business or you know you're running the household and you you know you want to have this conversation and parent somebody, it's the same concept. It's like, listen, the reason why I want to have this conversation with you and the preframes, the reason why I want to have this conversation with you is because I thought I've been seeing this. I'd really like to start seeing this happen and I'd like to kind of close that gap. Is it okay if we could have a conversation about closing that gap? Right? So my, it might be like, this is where you are. This is where I'd like you to be. There's a gap there. Can this conversation just be a bridge to bridge that gap in, in, in pretty, pretty simplistic way. You could, it's, you, you, you could adopt that similar philosophy for any type of conversation. Right. Right. What are some other like nuts and bolts that come up for you that you like to use in these transformative conversations that help you actually help somebody implement a real change that is lasting in their lives? 
and specifically to rapport and preframe or like the next it could be step anything yeah it could be the next steps it could be you know anything. yeah the next step after preframe is usually the discovery where mm-hmm. I'm, I'm gonna ask i'm gonna start asking some of the deeper questions so during the discovery part of this conversation is very much curiosity and you want to have some really good go-to questions to ask, you said to ask where you can get below the surface so um a, a couple of examples might be so let's say um yeah, I, 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 using the subordinate or using the parenting type of uh, conversation I just mentioned, it's like, so I noticed you did this. I'd like to know a little bit more about what was your reasoning behind doing that? Like, what was your reasoning behind those actions? Like, what was going through your mind? Uh, kind of funny. I, had, I actually just had a parent conversation with my dad uh, um, because if you follow me on Facebook, uh, he was rolling around the snow in a, uh, like a thong jock strap. <laughs> My dad is okay. uh, 81 years old. He's 81 years old. He is insane. And he uh, decided to go Facebook live to go, to go roll around in the snow and talk about the health benefits of being 81 years old and cold therapy and loving the snow and all this. And so how is this not going viral? We gotta, we gotta make this go, you know, he's at like 1500 views so far. Nice. So, uh, perfect. Nice. That's <laughs> hilarious. Uh, hilarious. So I had, I had, I called him and I supported him. I put a whole nice post. I was like, all right, my dad's nuts. So I love him. I'm going to support him. And I called him and I was like, dad, so, um, I created a proof. I said, Dad, I'm curious. Hmm. You know, by the way, you know, I saw it snowing. I saw the post on Facebook. Oh, I'm glad you're doing well. I'm, I hope you're warm now. But you know, I got to ask you. You went on this live and you wore a thong, and you know, it's kind of uh, interesting. I, I'm curious, Dad. Like, I'm sure you had a reason behind doing this. What was your reason? Like, what was going through your mind? Like that led up to the moment of the decision to actually do that. And it opened up the conversation. Then from the conversation, he kind of filled in some of the gaps. But it's just a very simple example to let them come to the surface, let them bring what's real to the surface with creating that type of question asking. And then it's like, tell me more about that. So tell you know, tell me a little bit more about that. Like, why is that important to you? So then, you know, using my using this crazy example, my dad, it's like, why was that important to you for you to you know go do that? And like, just asking like. Okay, so cool. Tell me more about that. Like, where do you think that comes from? Now, I obviously, for this conversation with my dad, I wasn't like psychoanalyzing him. But when you're having a conversation with someone, it's like, where do you think that stems from? Why do you think that? Why do you think that's important to you? Cool. Do you think that's important to you? Or do you think it's important to other people in your life and you want to please those people? So therefore, you made it important to you. Uh, I see. So it's like, entering into their paradigm a little bit and also not only entering into the way they see the world, but it's also questioning a little bit of how they see the world because maybe they never even thought about it. Maybe there's some of their belief systems aren't even their, theirs. It's actually imposed beliefs by, by by their environment or by their parents or by their circumstances. And they never even had a conversation. Like I had a conversation with someone once. I was like, um, the real, let me t- let me ask you this. Um, I know you you mentioned about your relationship with money that like money's hard to come by. Is that something that came from like your upbringing? Like, did you have any memory of your upbringing where money was hard to come by? Like growing up, and she said, "It's crazy because I do remember you know one time when I was thirteen or twelve years old and I observed the conversation. And I heard them say uh, that my parents have a combo is money is really hard to come by. Make sure you save a lot of your money." I said. And you, that was 13 year old you. How old are you now? She's like, I'm 60. I said, there's probably a lot of things that happened when you were 13 years old that you don't remember, but you specifically remember that one thing when you were 13 and now you're 60. So 50 years later, you still remember that memory. Why do you think out of everything that happened when you were 13, you remember that one specific moment? Why do you think that was so important for you? Why is it so meaningful for you? And then she was like, Oh my God, I never really thought about this, but that was a traumatizing experience for me because she's like, I was like asking for like the new shoes. I was asking for like clothes and stuff like that. She's like, Oh my God. So I stopped asking for stuff because I realized money is hard to come by. And that was a a framework of her whole life. I said, well, if we had a label, the 13 year old version of you, what would you call her? Okay. We call her that. Well, that 13 year old version of you is still driving, you know, making decisions for the 60 year old version of you. Is that real? Like, is that the truth? 
is money hard to come by? Like if you need to make more money, could you make more money? So just by exploring it with some of these conversations uh, is, is something that, that um, I, again, I, I just kind of ranting over there, but during that discovery phase, it's finding this balance of curiosity and maybe bringing in a little bit of intuition, a little bit of wisdom, uh, you know, what, what's showing up. I don't know if any of that kind of, Oh no, totally. It's, it, it all has to do with being curious, right? Like the discovery phase in the, you know, the basic philosophy here is how can we help somebody if we don't really understand what their needs are? How can we help somebody if we don't understand what their challenges are? And, um, you know, we really have to try to get to the root of the problem. You know, we were talking a little bit about emotions and, you know, when we think about, you know, any sort of big decision, it's an, it's an emotional decision. Um, you know, when we think about whether it's the decision to, um, you know, completely radically change your diet and exercise routines, whether it's the decision to, uh, you know, take a new position uh, as a new company, whether it's the decision to, uh, you know, ask a, a partner to marry you or to get a divorce or whatever these big decisions are in our lives uh, that people are struggling with, um, there's a lot of emotion around them. And so we need to actually go into the emotion in the conversation. Um, and the way to do that is to actually ask these discovery questions about, okay, what's going on? And then how does it, you know, how does that feel on a daily basis? What's that experience like, you know, um, on, a, on a regular basis so that people can connect with those emotions? Uh, you know, uh, one of the realities is unless somebody's dealing with something, you know, that uh, is on that lower tier sort of emotions, uh, which by the way, for me, uh, I would say are guilt, shame, uh, apathy, anger, uh, frustration, fear, um, you know, anxiety. Some of these are more, um, you know, subsets of different emotions, but that's something in that range, then A, they don't need a transformation uh, if they're not having those feelings. But, but B, you know, uh, the reality is if, you, if they aren't sharing those things with you uh, and you're trying to help them out, it means they don't feel safe enough to share them. It's not because they don't have them typically. Uh, and so we need to be uh, create a space and cultivate a space for them to do that by practicing non-judgment and asking open-ended questions just to get the truth out there and to get them flowing a little bit uh, and, and in that state where they're open enough to share. And then what I like to do, once we have like an assessment of where they're at, I like to ask consequence-based questions that drive that emotion deeper. Uh, and I'm I'm going to drive it to both polarities, right? So the first polarity is what I call hell, and the second polarity is heaven. Essentially, it's like a pain pleasure, you know, sandwich that we're going to create here. And so the pain sandwich, the pain part of the sandwich is, um, hey, what's the consequence if this continues to be a problem in your life? Right? What you know? Okay, what are some other? What else? What are other some of the other consequences? Uh, what's the consequence of that? What's the consequence of that? And I want to go two, three, four, five layers deep, as deep as possible. Um, you know, who else is affected by that? How would that feel on a regular basis? So we're really amping up the, the their association in real time on this call to the pain. And then I'm going to flip the coin. Hey, thanks for going there with me. On the flip side, if you do solve this problem, what what's that going to feel like? Paint a picture for me. A year from now, where are you going to be? What's that going to look like? What's that going to feel like? What's it going to look like five years from now? What about 10 years from now? What about, you know, when you're on your rocking chair, how's it going to feel knowing that you solved this problem in 2022 and you got a hold of it and the rest of your whole whole life, you had this, this problem conquered. How's that going to feel? And they're like, mm, it's going to feel awesome. It's going to feel great. And all of a sudden we're starting to like create that pain pleasure sandwich. And now they're really motivated. They're really inspired to take action um, because the emotions there, otherwise it's like, they know what they should do. Like everyone knows what they should do, right? Like, and we can talk to anybody in the whole world. They know what they should do probably, but why aren't they doing it? And it's mostly because they're not associated to the pain that they're actually in currently. And then the pleasure they could experience if they actually did solve the problem. Mike, what say you? Yeah, when you talk about the pain, uh, sometimes people aren't going to want to go there. So they're going to put on some sort of guard or some sort of shield. So it's important for you to create the space where it feels very safe. For example, if you say, so like, hey, what are the consequences of going there? And they're like, uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't really feel, do we have to really talk about that? It's like, we don't have to, you know, we don't, we definitely don't have to. And I just want to make sure, you know, I let you know, and then you can share a personal story. It's like, 
but the reason why I asked the question to you is because when it was asked to me, I saw it opened up possibilities of life that I, I, I didn't even know existed. And I just want that for you. So maybe this isn't real. Maybe these consequences aren't, don't exist. But if you had to say possibility, potentially, maybe, what are some possible consequences? Like if you were to continue on this path, what, what might maybe show up for you down the road if you continue to treat your body this way or if you continue to you know show up for your business this way or you continue just on this path like what would the compound effect of that look like maybe and then sometimes they'll laugh like if they giggle it's like well i'll be fat you know and they'll laugh at their own pain now as the leader of this conversation if they laugh at their own pain you're you're making you're breaking some ground which is really good you want to hold space so if you laugh with them you're, you're now like kind of showing them it's like, okay, versus holding space. And I would hold, if they laugh at their, if they laugh at their pain, I'm like, yeah, what, what, what about that? You know, what, what about that? Tell me more about that. Why would that be something, right? So if they're like, oh, I'll be fat maybe I'll get sick. I don't know. I don't know. And I'm like, yeah, what about that? Getting fat, getting sick. Tell me more about that. Like, what are some potential consequences of getting fat or getting sick or, you know, not showing up in the business? Right? So you're holding space as the authority, You even if they are laughing, if they cry, if, if you ask the consequence pain, pain question and it triggers an emotion and they start crying and you make it feel like a little awkward where it's like, uh, sorry about that. I didn't mean to make you cry. Like, uh, like one of those. That's, that's, that's not, it's like, just hold space, breathe. You know, I slow down your breath. I think it's really important. You slow down your breath, slow down your nods a little bit and just sit there and just nod, slow down your voice. Say, I see you had, uh, you know, some trigger there. What, um, what do you think that trigger was? You know, and slow it down, hold the space. So that way they really feel into whatever that pain was. So uh, that's the, that's what showed up for me during this like pain, uh, using your reaction to the pain and, and holding that space and creating the space for them to really feel into it uh, and not just avoiding it and going directly to the pleasure because the transformation happens through the tunnel of pain. And if you can continue through the tunnel of pain and get them to the other end of that tunnel and, and show them what the light of pleasures looks like, uh, that that's where the transformation takes place. And that's why obviously we're spending an entire day, day three of our event in March, dedicated to a lot of this transformational type of conversations because there's a lot to unpack here. There's a lot to unpack on how to read between the lines, how to show up and how to intuitively be able to know what energy to call forward and what are the cues and what are the signs because it, it, it does take a little bit of, of skill uh, and practice. So, and you've yeah. been the master of this with me, Andrew, over the last, you know, half a decade or more. So, yeah. um, so I, yeah, we'll, we'll kick it back to you. Skill and practice, right? Like, you know, I definitely think, uh, it takes a lot of practice and a lot of people are uncomfortable in those situations. And so, um, you know, being comfortable in those sort of like potentially awkward situations where somebody's triggered, um, and staying present, staying with them, like we need to be able to guide them through, you know, the hell, right? And then show them the heaven uh, in order to actually create that transformation that's going to last. Uh, and I think like a lot of people have conversations, uh, you know, I, give me a give me a hell yeah in the audience if you're listening now and you can relate to this situation. You have a conversation with somebody about, you know, their performance at work. Maybe it's like somebody who's a sales rep on your team or something. And you have a great conversation. You think it went really well. You think Think like, oh yeah, we had a great conversation. They're all set. They're definitely going to sell this much this week, this much next, this month, this much this year. And then guess what happens, right? Um, they go out and they do basically nothing, right? Or they, uh, or they go out and maybe they're good for a few weeks and then they fall off. Uh, and it just doesn't like, it doesn't take, right? Um, why is that? It's because the emotion wasn't strong enough. Their why uh, wasn't big enough. They weren't fully connected to the pain that they're going to 
experience that they don't solve the problem, uh, which is poor performance in this case, and the pleasure that they're going to experience when they do solve the problem. Um, so, you know, helping them really connect to these emotions is what's going to create the lasting change. You know, the last thing I like to do before you kind of basically just say, okay, well, hey, are you in uh, on this vision for yourself? is I like to check their commitment because in some ways it's really easy to say all the right things up until this point because a lot of times again people know what they're supposed to do but once they like at the end of the day we still need to get them across the point of no return right and that's that decision point that turning away from all other options that Tony Robbins talks about that we need to get them to and once you make a decision it really you know it's really easy to stick to it but if you don't fully make the decision and you just have to see it as a nice to have or a nice to do, people aren't going to actually transform. So the best way that I know how to do that as a leader is to ask them for, I like to do a commitment check. So I ask, hey, uh, it looks like, you know, if you don't change, this is your future, right? This pain, 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 pain. And if you do change, this is your future, this pleasure, 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 pleasure. And um, now that you're here and you're looking at these two options, you're standing at the fork in the road, how committed on a scale from one to 10 are you to that second reality? What would you say on a scale from one to 10? And it's a really uh, revealing question because ultimately what people do is they kind of give you, you know, one of three things. One is like a seven through a nine. Uh, that's like a very comfortable answer. Very rarely is someone going to say below a seven if you've done this conversation well at all. Um, if they do, by the way, I basically just throw it out. I'm like, hey, just so you know, if you're a six out of 10 committed to that vision, it's not going to happen. I can't help you. Michael Bromwitz can't help you. Tony Robbins can't help you. Uh, you can hire the best coach in the world. You're not going to hit it because you're just not committed enough. So I totally like take the option of working with me off the table if it's a six out of ten if it's seven through a nine um i'll I'll kind of thank them for you know being honest with me because i do see those as honest answers and then i'm going to basically walk them through you know well hey what's stopping you from being a 10 so we can actually address the fear that's there and really what's stopping them is it's fear uh that's all that's stopping them could be fear of failure fear of missing out fear that they're not good enough fear of, of of you know anything in this world world, but there's some kind of fear that's holding them back from from being a 10. And even if someone's a nine, you're sitting there listening to this, you're like, hey, I got someone to a nine out of 10. That's pretty good. They're probably going to follow through, right? Nope. They're not. Zero percent chance they follow through. You know why? Because they didn't cross the point of no return. You're either a 10 or you're not a 10. So, hey, hey, I appreciate that you're a nine. And also, what's stopping you from being a 10? You know, we need to handle that 10%. I don't care if they're 99.999% in. If there's even a little hint that they're not fully across that point of no return, it's not going to work. By the way, the two other options before I kick it back to you, Mike, are the fake 10 and the real 10. The real 10 is obvious, um, where it's just like, I'm a 10, man. I'm ready. Like, let's go. I wasn't sure before this this conversation, but now I'm ready. Um, and you can just have a sense. You're looking for ecology between their tone of voice, their language, and their body language. And if like those things are matching up, you can kind of sense that it's real. But a fake 10 is kind of like this. It's like, uh, you know, I would say, Mike, like, I think I'm like a 10 probably. <laughs> and like when someone says that, it's very obvious that they're not a 10 if you're reading between the lines and paying attention to the cues. So then, hey, I appreciate that you want to be a 10. And yeah, I'm sensing some hesitancy. And I'm going to take it right back. What's stopping you from being a really a 10? What would you say? What was that hesitancy about? I'm going to point that out. So uh, that commitment check is just a really important skill that so many leaders, so many managers miss out on. And they think they have a transformative conversation but it didn't actually um, get them across the point of no return. And so we're right back where we started, you know, a few weeks later. Mike, what do you think? And, and knowing your knowing your demographic, oftentimes they're going to have a tough time making a full commitment to that 10. And that's why you need to become very good at this conversation. I would re-listen to everything that Andrew just laid out for you because if you listen to this fundamental approach... You know, Andrew said there was art and he said there was science. What he just laid out for you was 100% science. Do the open with the question and the rapport, pre frame, discovery, go through the pain, go through the pleasure, and then you do a commitment check. And he, he just gave you the blueprint. And if you can get really good at that blueprint, that's the, that's the, that's the skill, that's the science. You're also going to position yourself to practice, and you can get a little bit better at the art, which takes you know takes some time, takes some skill, takes some practice. But uh, that was super methodical, 
and uh, and, and, and perfect uh, perfect perfect execution with the commitment check. If if they're if they're hesitant, oftentimes people just have a tough time making a commitment. They might they have, I mean especially men uh, typically. I mean I I, don't, I can't speak on behalf of all men, but a, a lot of men are uh, you know. I typically. think there's a lot of women in the audience saying amen right now. Uh, men struggling. Uh, it's, yeah. you know, it's like you know, a lot of men have a tough time with commitment, and I know I know I'm guilty of that i can't speak on behalf of man population but so if we if we know that that's the demographic and you're talking to someone who has a tough time making a commitment um well acknowledge that so bringing that up almost like a pre-frame to the commitment check it's like listen maybe in the maybe in the past you had a tough time making commitments to certain things and if, if in the past you had a tough time making a commitment to certain things and you saw the type of results and potential consequences of not making commitments uh, as a, a full 10 and you see the possibilities of when you do make a commitment to a full 10, I have to ask you, what is your commitment to this right now? One through 10. Like you might even want to bring that in to the commitment check uh, again, reading between the lines a little bit and creating the space for that, that conversation to be had where it's like, you know what? Damn, you're good at this. You're right. I have had a tough time with commitment in the past. You know, this woman I'm with, I freaking love her. She's fantastic. And I'm concerned about blah, 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 blah. And I'm a 10, you know, I'm, I'm a 10. I, I've got to make, make sure that she knows I'm a 10, that I know I'm a 10. I'm not going to let the, 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 the craziness of my past get in the way of what I believe the future could be. I'm a 10, right? Just by you creating that, that space for them to reflect back. It's like, yeah, by you being indecisive or not committing, it has created consequence and bringing that into the commitment check could be a really good idea. Uh, so, so mm-hmm. yeah, I just uh, wanted to double click on that one. Totally, totally. Well, hey, this has been really fun. The last thing I'll just share with you is just to make sure that you have next steps in place. So if it's a sale, you know, then ask for the order. If it's a, you know, subordinate that's reporting to you, plan out the next step, be a plan for how they're going to implement this. Uh, and that's oftentimes the easier part of this conversation that I think a lot of people, you know, should know how to do. If you need some help with that, ask us some questions in the chat or uh, shoot Mike or I a DM. But uh, that's really just what I think a lot of people like to do is just get, try to like, how are we going to solve this problem, right? Now, like, let's put together a plan. But th- that's only, it's not even half the battle. That's like 5% of the battle. Most, again, most of the time, people know how to do what they're supposed to do. People know how to lose weight. It's not a matter of that. You'd have to be like live your entire life off the internet to not know how to lose weight. The whole point is there's a million different ways. There's a million different people telling you how you can do it. And they probably all have some efficacy that all could all work. What matters is, are you actually going to do it? And that's what this is going to help people do. And again, whether it's so losing weight, better sales performance, uh, better you know showing up and solving a particular blind spot, better relational conversations and communication. There's so many different uh, applications of this. So, Mike, any closing thoughts before we let everyone go for the day? But having a follow-up plan to that, you know, so once you do have those next steps, making sure that there's some some sort of accountability in place. Something I like to do is uh, just take some notes or shorthand notes on the conversation and send it to them in a recap. So that way I have notes on the recap, they have notes on the recap, and it's easy for us to revisit for our future conversations. So that way when we have the next combo, I have something documented to circle back on. It's like, hey, so you know, tell me a little bit about you know what we spoke about the last time and I can pull up that recap. And it just makes it really easy uh, to, cons- to, to keep the conversation going when we're already had the conversation. Totally, totally. Awesome. Well, this has been a pleasure. How to have transformative conversations, the definitive guide uh, has been laid out. And also there's so much more uh, and so much more nuance that you can get with this. If you have questions, let us know. Uh, If you want to join us in Tampa in March, please do. Uh, No matter what, I hope you all have a great week ahead. And remember to leave today better than you found it. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the show, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest from us, you can follow us on Instagram at better than underscore rich and join our Facebook group at the better than rich show. 
Thanks again for listening. We look forward to seeing you next time. And remember, leave today better than you found it.